The Visiting Artist Program, funded by PAFA's graduate program, brings an outstanding roster of local, national, and international artists to PAFA each semester for lectures, critiques, and workshops. The program exposes students and the public to a range of artistic approaches and fosters discussion about contemporary art and ideas. Before we begin, the Visiting Artist Program wants to thank the PNC Arts Alive's program for sponsoring today's lecture. PNC Arts Alive challenges visual and performing arts organizations to put forth their best, best most original thinking and expanding audience participation and engagement. This commitment advances the PNC Foundation's mission of community development. This afternoon, we are pleased to have Heidi Norton joining us. Heidi Norton is an artist and writer whose 1970s upbringing as a child of new age homesteaders in West Virginia resulted in a strong connection to the land, plant life, and nature. Heidi's work intertwines materials such as wax, glass, and resin with plant life and organic matter. She received her BFA from the University of Maryland in Baltimore and her MFA from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. She was a recipient of a residency at Elmhurst Art Museum where her exhibition, Prismatic Nature, a major site responsive exhibition was on view. Her writings and work are included in the Journal for Artistic Research, Graphs by Michael Martyr and the newly released Why Look at Plants by Giovanni Oli. She was featured in Art 21's Revolution issue, Homesteading as Art and Revolution, where she discusses the relationship between her art and culture. Her most recent illustrated essay, The Faceless Plant, a sketch for Timothy Morton, is in a recent issue of Bomb Magazine. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Heidi. You may now begin sharing your screen. Awesome, let me see if I can do this. I do it every day, so I should be able to. Okay. Looking good. Good, and you guys can hear me okay? Yep, you sound good. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you so much, Marley, for that introduction. And thank you, Visiting Arts Artist Program at PAFA. I'm so delighted to be here. Um, and I look forward to studio visits in the afternoon and learning more about everybody's practice. So it's a true um, honor and thank you again for having me. Um, so I'm an interdisciplinary artist with an MFA in photography. So you'll see a lot of references to images and image making and the process of image making in relationship to sculpture and architecture, other mediums as well. Uh, I recently founded Vantage Points, which is a non-traditional art mentoring and education platform united by community. So uh, community is also something that pops up in my work a lot. Um, I thought I would start by just giving a little introduction to my work. Um, I have worked for years to develop a botanical vocabulary using mostly the mediums of photography, sculpture, and installation to trouble traditional conceptions of nature and how humans choose to preserve it both physically and psychologically. So here you can see a studio shot um, from my studio not far from me um, in Brooklyn. I'm at my house right now. But um, you can see a variety of different sculptures and photography, wall coverings, etc. Um, while addressing themes of impermanence and mortality, my work invites reflection on cultural attitudes towards the natural world, modes of display, and how different media, especially photography and sculpture, register time and organize our sense of space. I am always looking for tension, whether it conflates the interior and exterior realms, reality and illusion, organic and artificial, or cycles of life and death. And this tension is very important in my practice. Um, and so we'll look at more examples of that later on. Um, I wanted to start with this slide um, because I, as Marley mentioned, I also sometimes write. Um, this is a piece that I did not too long ago for Bob Magazine. Um, and I, when I do my writings, I, when I write, 
Um, I mean, I've done artist interviews and some exhibition reviews, but mostly my writing is a collaboration with plant philosophers and scientists to add another kind of layer or depth to my practice and my research. Um, I start with this slide because I think it supports my practice and illustrating a little bit um, about my process, which is very much about experimenting and upcycling and appropriating materials, um, as well as my interest in interdisciplinary concepts around ecology. Um, like I said, this is a piece that I did uh, for BOM in their essay sections in 2018. Um, and what I did here is I took Timothy Morton's text and scanned it, and then I modified the text by grafting my own ephemera and material and plants and text into um, the book. And uh, I did, it was not the whole book, it was 10 pages. Um, so it was different excerpts that I curated from the book that I thought related to different ideas within my own practice. Um, so I don't know if anyone's read Ecological Thought or has read any sections of it. It's a great book. I like all of Timothy Morton's stuff. So um, please, if you don't know his stuff and you're interested in these topics, you should look him up. Um, but in Ecological Thought, Timothy um, or Morton argues that all forms of life are connected in a vast entangling mesh. And in order to make a change, we must understand the interconnectedness and the symbiotic relationships. This urgent awareness of ecological reality is necessary in the age of global warming. So you can see um, on the piece, uh, my piece on the right here, what I've done is scanned different surfaces of my work and taken different photographs and 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 plants and different um, ephemera and I, including text, and I, like I say, grafted it into uh, the book. You can also see my redactions and edits and notes um, in the you know, in the in the margins of the book, um, which also become important layers too in the whole piece. Um, but I wanted to read the top part of this, which is um, an excerpt from a collaboration I did with Karsten Lund, who's an artist and a curator. He works at the Renaissance Society in Chicago presently, but he also curated my show at the MCA, Museum of Temporary Art, uh, in 2014. And this text is from a book project that we did together that actually took the format very similar to this, where we took a bunch of my own research books um, that I was using for an exhibition, and we edited and grafted and manipulated and modified them um, uh, to kind of fit the themes around my own practice to give more insight into my work, but also just um, to create also these different forms of identity particularly an identity from the plant's point of view. Um, so I'll get into that though in a second, um, but I wanna read the top part, the quote on the top right. Um, At one point long ago, there, there was no such thing as inside and outside. And then there was, and what we call nature was outside, plants and rocks and dirt, bees and rivers and etc. And they figured out how to bring it all inside and name it and corral it into their gardens or put us up on shelves. And I really like this text um, because it shifts between two perspectives and two points of view. Um, the point of the the point of view of the human as well as the plant. <clears throat> and so some questions that I'm often thinking about, you know, just and within my own work, but philosophically as well is, you know, what is nature? Um, how is it different than ecology um, in the natural world? How do we use that word nature? Um, and then how do we preserve it? Uh, and then, you know, thinking about the use of photography in that process, the use of the institution or the museum through herbarariums, we press it, we store it, we display it, we enlarge it, we dissect it. And how does this mark time? And what about the invisible elements in nature that we can't see? How do we mark them? And in this piece, <clears throat> this book, I mean, this, this project that I did, and also in my work, I really want to give the plants a voice equal to that of the human. I talk often from their perspective or from their point of view, but also I talk as the plant in my own work. 
So I'm going to read the bottom excerpt here too. But these stories are for another day. I am here, well, at least my ghost is, to tell you about how my life changed that one day in late spring of 2010. I was sitting on a pallet crammed in between a bunch of palms at the Home Depot. A lady came by and plucked me away and stuffed me in the back of a hot moving vessel. I arrived in what seemed to be a warm, airy, and sunlit space. There I lived for several months growing quite lush and green. Until one day she took me down and started painting a cold, gooey material on my epidermis. All over she covered me with this material. I later found out it was latex paint. Covering the leaves with a substance made of petroleum equals covering me with Vaseline. Have you ever heard of such a thing? It will close the stomatal openings. And stomata assist in the gaseous exchange and water evaporation or loss from leaf surface and transpiration and photosynthesis. Gradually, I will cease metabolic activity resulting in my death and I will become the ghost of nature. So it was funny because I was actually in an exhibition later on that you'll see entitled Ghost Nature um, that dealt with a lot of these ideas around how the word nature can actually inhibit it, the growth of ecological thinking, which is also what Timothy Morton is like the main thesis of his writing. Um, and uh, so let me just move on to uh, this piece. So this is a piece called Whitescape. Um, it's a 4550 um, archival pigment print, so it exists as a photograph. Um, it's from the series New Age Still Life, which is probably one of 20 images that are in this series. Um, <clears throat> the piece that was talking, the plant that had a voice here <laughs> in the last chapter, or um, the last excerpt, is this plant right here. This is the, the infamous Diffenbachia plant. Um, that resurfaces in many of my photographs, marking different points of life and death and kind of cycling through life and death. Um, again, it becomes a marker of sort in a photograph, um, a marker of time in life. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this, this series, New Age Still Life, this photographic series, because it's an important uh, origin piece, um, an origin series to, to my whole process. Um, so I was teaching color photography and well color theory and photography uh, at SAIC during this time and I had taught it for many years and this book by David Batchelor became very important to me it's called chromophobia have any of you guys read it it's it's awesome. Um, it's really what I love the way he writes because it's so kind of out there and abstract and then he like reels it back in and it's just a wonderful mix of, of different styles of writing um but the the thesis like to, to kind of get it in a little nutshell of five words is he's talking about the fear of corruption or the contamination through the use of color particularly in art and media and culture um and there's a chapter in the book called whitescape and this chapter, he's talking about going into an art collector's house that was completely white. It was almost like the, the infamous white cube. So the walls were white, the floor was white, there was white light everywhere. And he was talking about the how confusing this was and how disorientating it was and where it was really hard for him to understand where the space started and where it ended. So this is a little excerpt from the chapter. If it if it started with a short visit to an inside out interior of a colorless whiteness where clarity was confusion and simplicity was complication and art was uniformly gray, then it would be comforting to think that it might also end here. So, you know, I had all, I had all of these, you know, I mean, one thing I really like about this piece and one thing I kind of pu pu pushed in to, um, from this piece and into my sculptural works later on is this beautiful and confusing space where it's hard to decipher where things start and where they begin so this like starting and reversing um and i was you know super into the light and space movement at the time and thinking about robert Irwin, and i was photographing with a four by five camera so this was like 
to create this these disorientating spaces where you were taking 3D kind of sets in a sense and photographing them through the apparatus of a four by five where the lens plane and the film plane are completely separate. They're able to be moved interchangeably. I was able to create, you know, this kind of disorientation or this confusion um, while while dealing with like multiple planes. Um, and so I was doing thinking about all of that stuff and thinking about color and its use or not in my work. And then I also was, uh, you know, at the time, a little anecdote here. I had my parents had sent me a box of books and objects from their youth. Um, and my parents were deeply immersed in the counterculture of the 60s and 70s, as like Marley mentioned, they were um, original back to land movers. They fled um, Baltimore City during the Vietnam War, um, and they <laughs> they fled by buying a plot of land out of the back of a Mother Earth magazine <laughs> and like the 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 ads section. Um, and so they had no idea anything about the Appalachia. They went to Appalachia to the holler to this land that they purchased. And um, well, we'll just say they haven't been back in 30 years. <laughs> They, they own the land. They don't know anything about it. They like, I'm like, can you guys look at it on Google Earth? Like find out what's going on there. And I and I am going to make a journey there soon. I told my dad um, that I would take over the land. Um, he's like, good luck. But um, I'll talk more about what happened and the failures there. Um, but inside of this inside of this box of books and objects was this collection of foxfire books which they actually used as land manuals to help them live off of the land in practical terms i don't know if you guys have ever read them um they're pretty cool um but inside of the book was this folded up note and so i was like oh i wonder what this is it kind of just looked like a bookmark and i unfolded it and it was this home remedy uh for an injury made by a rusty nail and the home remedy was like find some bacon and some cobwebs and then wrap it in muslin and then wrap that around the rusty nail and <laughs> i was like this is the craziest home remedy so i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna trick i'm gonna like get my dad so i uh called him up i told him i had stepped on a nail in the studio but that i was happy that i found this home remedy in one of his books and that i was gonna use it and he was like what are you crazy like that sounds insane you need to go to the emergency room immediately and get a tetanus shot and i was like okay well you wrote it like and he and he was like no i didn't write that i was like yes you did and i showed him the note and he still refused to believe that he wrote it and his handwriting was so dis is so distinct and this is just like one small example of how they have chosen to completely separate from their past. Um, and so this moment was important for me because it felt really sad um, and it felt like their past went missing. And um, and so, and that they chose to kind of rewrite their own, their own history. And so for me, by painting these objects white, um, it was a way for me to kind of redact, I guess, their past and like take the objects and completely neutralizing, neutralize them. Um, so after I made the, this photographic piece, I also made a black piece called Blackscape. You can see it hanging here on the back wall. Um, this is an installation shot from a, a show, uh, called the newest romantics sculptors of botanical photography, uh, from the new art center in Newton, Massachusetts. Um, and from there for at least a year I started making these various uh, arrangements and constructions in my studio um, and I got super into a couple different things like at this point I was very interested in trying to understand my parents relationship to the new age movement because it became more fascinating to me that they didn't want to like associate or align with it anymore um and uh so i started thinking about you know how do these images critique it how do they examine counterculture um especially the new age movement um which emerged emerged in the 60s and 70s 
Um, I mean, I'm sure you guys know a lot it a lot about it, but provided alternative approaches to traditional Western culture through spirituality, mysticism, holism, and environmentalism. My parents also uh, eventually moved to the panhandle of West Virginia, where uh, Peter Tompkins, who wrote The Secret Life of Plants, lived, that he was their neighbor. Um, and also they were involved in a commune where Patch Adams was also an active member. So they, they um, you know, I had this like strange ambivalence to new ageism, like in this project, I'm, I'm kind of like in some ways critiquing it, you know, and poking at it, but in other ways I am lifting it up. Um, and so I, um, made these arrangements um, in my studio for, you know, at least six months. And, and then I got super into, um, you know, I was talking about before how the apparatus of the four by five can, you know, confuse the space and create these interesting visual disruptions, um, as well as multiple exposures. So this is called downward pool of the mind. Um, it's a multiple exposure in camera with a four by five. And, um, it is um, made with this huge plexi box that I had fabricated it almost looks like a display case, but it has multiple planes it had four planes with shelves at varying distances and heights from the camera and I would set up these arrangements in this large like sculptural box and then I would photograph them so I would take something that was like super three dimensional and flatten it out into this this 2D plane um, and the you know often the works kind of float it somewhere between like painting sometimes they look like paintings, especially the white scape and black space um, scape pieces. And, and they also often look like photographs or even drawings sometimes. Um, so I worked on this stuff for a while and then it was summertime and I had had planned this road trip um, across the mid Atlantic and I really wanted to go back to where I grew up. <clears throat> and investigate the landscape there um, this landscape is a quarry network of tunnels that runs like 10 15 miles underground in the panhandle of West Virginia. Um, this is a picture of me canoeing through these caves. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of get reconnected with this landscape, but I also um, spent some time uh, wandering about, um, so just real quick about how this landscape came to be. So my parents left, had this land in Appalachia and the holler, and it just didn't work out. Like they couldn't figure out how to, commune with more so the community of people that live there, their lifestyles were too different. Um, and it ended up being um, not as utopic as they thought. Um, so my dad hitchhiked north um, to the panhandle of West Virginia, where close to where West Virginia, that little hook where it touches Maryland. And he eventually saved up enough money by selling wood stoves and repairing shoes and having these different odds and ends jobs to buy this plot of land on this quarry. And this quarry became this magical playground of my youth. It was completely sublime. It looked like this blue lagoon. lagoon. I had never seen anything like it. And it really connected me deeply to the natural world. Like everything that we did was around the land and everything we got was from the land. And, and I felt a deep communal connection to it. Um, when I was 12, my parents thought that we weren't, we were too isolated and that we needed to be socialized more. Um, my sister also had disabilities and so we needed some more resources for her. So we moved to um, Maryland, um, close to the Antietam battlefield. And um, this is a series of photographs that I created during that time around the Underground Railroad. So the Underground Railroad runs around, you know, up through Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. And um, I have always been, you know, interested in this idea that the land is laden with secrets. Um, I'm particularly interested in the Underground Railroad you know, in that it's a it's it's like dependency on the land in terms of like creating networks 
um, that assisted in the abolitionist being able to kind of move people from the south to the north and and their dependency on the land, um, whether the land is like territory zones to hide people or even to um, to you know survive off of in terms of finding plants to forage, et cetera. Um, so I spent some time photographing the um, these different sites along the Underground Railroad. Um, this is Harriet Tubman's birthplace. The house is in the back here. Um, and, uh, you know, I did that over the, the course of the summer. These are photographic prints, again, shot with four by five. Um, they're quite large. They're around 30 by 40. And I came back to the studio and um, I was looking around my studio. So I had people water my plants because at this time, my studio was this like crazy mix of like <clears throat> a plant, like a, a kind of herbarium or not an herbarium, but a a uh, like botanical garden house, greenhouse mixed with like dirt and, and paint and film and dust. And it was this like weird place that like those two worlds could probably should never collide. You know, I'm like constantly keeping dust off film and then I have like dirt like smeared everywhere and, and eventually glass shards. But I had someone watering my, my little painted Diffenbachia and I guess I thought that when I arrived back, it would be dead. Um, but instead, it was um, alive, and it was alive more than ever. So I'm going to read the excerpt. This is another spread from the book um, or the piece that I did for Bob Magazine. So I'm going to read the bottom right piece of the text. Um, and all of this um, is available online, like on Bob's, Bob's website, if you guys want to look at it, and it's full. I walked back into the studio and looked around. There was the Diffenbachia, her white leaves limp. But shooting out of her center was a new sprout. The latex paint had caused the plant to die off while giving life to a new offspring. That was it. The tenuous rebirth of the Dickenbachia became an origin story of sorts and continued my investigation of the cycles of ecological change. Through the evolving combination of organic materials, photography, sculpture, and inorganic materials, my work speaks to the instability and liminality of time while investigating ideas of preservation through material and modes of display. Once you start to think it, you can't unthink it. So this is the four by five shot here, the film obviously of the still life that I shot uh, with that plant. Here's the Diffenbachia on the bottom left and here's the actual printed image. Um, this piece is called Deconstructed Rebirth. It's a, a 30 by 40 photograph um, printed. It's an archival pigment print. Um, Deconstructed Rebirth, the plants painted smooth. The plants, sorry, excuse me, smothered leaves hang limp while a single green shoot rises from its center. The Diffenbachia, like many plant species, drops its leaves to allow for new, new growth. And by 2011, when I photographed this particular plant, it had shed its painted leaves altogether. And the next piece that I'm going to show you, entitled My Diffenbachia Plant with Tarp Protection, a seemingly new plant appears, huddled behind a sheet of plastic in the light of the studio window. So this is that piece. So now the plant kind of reappears as a, as a completely new plant. Um, and so this seems like such a small like moment maybe and not that significant to people that are outside of my practice because but it became profound for me because it also um, started this introduction and this exploration into materiality and thinking about materials you know in this way the photograph became again like kind of marker of time of this plant so you could trace the plants life and death and spanses of life and death through the photograph um, and it preserved it in, in a different type of way around time um, uh, but i started trying to think a little bit more about okay well i've been using this i used this latex paint you know i was so shocked that it, that it didn't block you know, the, the, the block the plant's ability to go through photosynthesis to absorb light. Um, you know, so what kind of other materials can I kind of experiment that talk a little bit about preservation, um, quote unquote preservation, and it's, you know, successes or failures in the natural world. 
Um, so uh, this was my first. Um, uh, <laughs> This was my first experimentation with sculpture. So I was desperate. This piece is called Michael, and you're looking at the front and the back of it. So the white part, I mean, it doesn't have a front or back. You're looking at the one side, each side of it. Um, and you can see these are pieces where in the beginning, the roots um, were very important because I was trying to water them and keep them alive, <laughs> which I'll talk about the anxieties around that in a little bit. but. Um, so I was desperate to figure out how to take what I was seeing through the bellows and the ground glass of the camera. Um, and what I was seeing, if it, I'm sure if you've shot with a four by five camera, you don't see a flat 2D image. You actually see a projection on the ground glass. So it was both a 3D, three dimensional presentation and a flat representation um in real life so when photographing with a view camera it does two things simultaneously it allows you to see a live projected version like i just said but if you stand back and look at the surface of the glass you see a flat version the 2d version so there's a weird optical thing that you have to do when you're framing an image with the black sheet over your head where you're actually looking at a, a 3d kind of projection but then you shift the way your eyes see and then you look at like the 2d on the frame of the glass um, and at the same time, I became very interested in the materiality, like I was saying, of the plants layered with materials that kill them, but also, quote unquote, preserve them, especially the latex paint. I had a plant that um, was completed, was painted completely white and left for months only for me to come back and find that it had sprouted a new life. And I was thinking about also at the time I had gotten these books from my parents, my field guide from when I was a kid was in there. And it had all of these pressed uh, flowers and plants. I had no idea that I, I had forgotten I had this field guide as a kid. Um, and so I was thinking like, hmm, what about this idea of pressing a plant? And how can I get it? You know, and I had been thinking about how the glass frames, right? And how the glass is an easy, easy extension from 2D, like it's already a flat surface, you know? And so I'm like, hmm, what if I take the plant and literally press it against a piece of glass? And, you know, I, I wanted to actually try to create a 3D version of Whitescape. This is white, you know, Whitescape, just have it here for you guys to see again. So on this side, you can see that Whitescape very much resembles like the form um, or any type of depth that you see in the photograph. It's, you know, the, the very dimensional side of the piece. And then on this side, you have the very flat suffocated version of the piece. And in the beginning, um, where you get the color, which I feel like is like kind of the pops of color here. Um, and in the beginning of these, of this process of working uh, with with plants and glass, and in this case, resin, I, I worked in a much more painterly kind of way where I was using paint um, as one of the depths or layers in the process. Um, and so when you looked at these very close, you could see that the plants, they were looked like this kind of respiration process. There was that, like the, there was all these kind of bubbles that were forming. It looked like the plant was kind of encased inside of this uh you know 2d plane but then on the other side it was super 3d and i was so into this verso and i explore this again later at the mca show um but i also made pieces like this um where it does just straightforward it does look very much like a plant pressed against a piece of glass um and uh so so yeah i was thinking a lot at this point about that Robert Irwin, um, there was a, that Robert Irwin quote that says, um, the interdeterminate physicality with different physical planes, it's beautiful and confusing, everything is starting and reversing. And I read this um, piece by Slutsky and Rao called The Literal and Phenomenal about, <clears throat> and thinking about kind of literal spaces versus uh, phenomenal spaces that are created through, you know, illusion and light. Um, and so, these pieces for me became like a kind of natural extension from a photographic 2D plane into something that was 2D, but also 3D. Um, and it really also started to do this thing where I'll talk a little bit later on about how it moves the viewer around. So it activates the viewing experience. It makes the viewer, um, it forces the viewer to look from multiple different angles and vantage points 
and it kind of recreates a new composition each time the person looks at it. So from this perspective, you're looking at the side view of it, it's very it starts to become very different in later pieces from the anterior view of it, but also this piece um, is very precarious, you know, it's kind of hanging on on its side, it looks like it might fall over. Um, and this also becomes something that's important for me in my work is this kind of visual anxiety, where there starts to become a visual kind of uh, a metaphorically speaking this like uh, visual tension that happens where the work kind of feels like it's <laughs> about to kind of fall over in some senses. Um, there, there becomes a fragility in that that I'm interested in as well. So along the same time, I started experimenting with wax. And wax is, um, my parents were also beekeepers. They lived off the land. So we had a, like a mini format, we had bees, we had all of these different things. Um, and I got interested in wax because um, I was trying to play around with, again, these different ways to encase plants. Um, and I felt like the wax was had this very much like the density of the material very much referenced for me this idea of like fossiling or the earth um or thinking about the ground or the level spaces below or the areas below the earth whereas the glass pieces became very much about light and transparency and reflectivity and uh, you know kind of reframing the plants while using light and the wax pieces became much more about density and i felt like this combination of like i was telling you before i'm always kind of looking for these dichotomies but this kind of um, pushing and pulling with like transparency in relationship to density um became very important so here's a picture of me working in my studio you can see like there's like plants and wax and baby oil that's what i would use in my molds <laughs> um and uh you know, photographs and all of these things that have weird, um, you know, that aren't usually married together in one space. Um, and so, you know, rock formations, this is a photograph uh, from 2013 called Rock Face from the Paleozoic period. It was shot on residency in Wisconsin at Acre. Um, uh, so, you know, I started thinking about rock formations and these different kind of layers of the earth and where plant life, you know, kind of merges with them um, versus, you know, over the ground versus underground. And um, like the fossilization of like, how do you create this visual fossilization of the plant? Um, and so, the fossilization and these like visceral rack, wax puddles um, became super important to me. Um, and uh, I don't know, they, they started having connection to me with like silver gelatin snapshots of like deceased people, you know, revived but frozen in time. Like there were these interesting relationships about mortality um, and, and threads, even though these pieces look less photographic than say the glass pieces. Um, so this one's called moss hole too. So this was like my watering hole. And like I was telling you before, in the very beginning of these works, it was very important for me to try to keep the work, the, the plants alive, which seemed like an impossible task. Um, so I would like be stressing out, running to the studio all the time, like spraying the roots and watering the, the plant through the wax hole or through the moss hole. And this was just like a futile thing. I think it was actually like the act of it. You know, there was there is always a level of guilt with me with this work, where I, um, you know, feel guilty about killing the plants. And in the beginning, it was something that I was trying to, you know, I was trying to keep them alive. But I started to embrace the ecology and like the natural cycles of life and even the aesthetics of how the work changed. So like these leaves became you know, when I made it, they were green, later they became yellow. And so it changed like the composition, but I think of these works as totems and that I hope that when people, you know, are looking at them, they see the relationship of beauty and death and, um, and think a little bit about, you know, their, think also about their relationship um, to, to the natural, you know, to the natural world and, and, you know, how they exist in it um and and um and you know what they do to support the other you know lives outside of just being a human so um i uh 
so I started making these bigger pieces. So this is a much larger wax piece. Um, it's like, I think it's like 60 by like 40 or something like that. Um, and I started getting super into like making um, impressions on the surfaces, like this impressions, it looks like skin folds to me. So they start to have a somewhat of like kind of bodily reference. I also called these pieces wax tablets. Um, and so here you can see like the banana pea plant that's like completely kind of emerged or fossilized in the piece. Um, so scale started to become important to me. And, you know, these works were so fragile too, particularly these larger wax pieces. Um, and, um, and so this piece, so I had up until now, I had been making these wood stands for the glass pieces to go on. And they were kind of just like secondary. The display was very secondary at the time because mostly focusing on the materiality of the glass and thinking about the plants and um, the arrangements of the plants. This one is um, an herb titled Herbarium Specimens and Intersection. Um, and so obviously the title references this idea of an herbarium or this way of classifying plants. Um, and, and this visual, you know, for me, I, this visual dissection became very important, but also here, I wanted to talk about the display. So you can see here now the glass slices into the tablet, which becomes a support structure for the glass. But for me, metaphorically thinking, it's like the glass slicing into the earth. Um, and so this is kind of the beginning points too of like where I start pushing more into like the precariousness of the work and thinking about the fragility of it and what that means, you know, metaphorically and conceptually to the work. Um, and so I think it was important for me to merge the glass and wax pieces like I was trying to find arrangements where they could exist together versus like a wax, a wax piece on a wall and then a glass piece you know, on a stand, I want it to kind of marry the two um, and get them closer in terms of material. Um, so this big, huge wax chunk is poured by layers and inside of it is growing these different plants. Uh, you know, you can see the plants growing, you can see the dirt down here at the bottom. Um, so, you know, up into this point, um, or here at the, this is an installation shot from the Museum of Temporary Art exhibition um, from 2012. Um, and so you can see here now that the, the objects get, the pieces of glass get much, much larger. They are um, very, very big, beyond figurative. They are monumental to the body. Um, which becomes important um, and that the per the body, the person viewing it can see their reflection, that their reflection becomes merged in this kind of monument of sorts. Um, so the large glass pieces, uh, the large glass, uh, I call these the pressed plant paintings. So the large pressed plant paintings on glass exhibited at the Museum of Temporary Art in 2012 mark a new direction. Glass is revived from the museum storage Lit, that lived a previous life in Liam Gillick's work. So this glass was taken from his exhibition where he used vitrines that held various ephemera during his retrospective. So the appropriating of the glass from Liam Gillick, especially considering his work and the social practices around his work were very important, but also the appropriation of glass that was used as a vitrine, like as an actual display case. So the glass inherently speaks to surface and translucency, but also to the context of museum display. So this is where I kind of start pushing in more to museum display and thinking about how museums display the natural world. I thinking about science and optics. Um, the large scale works were made on the loading dock of the museum. So I actually use this, the museum as a studio site. Um, and the lifespan of the works only existed within the institution. So after the glass pieces were shown, they were destroyed. Um, it was created, defined, and destroyed in the space, aligning with the natural cycles inherent in my process. Beyond questions of display, the glass paintings use histories of abstraction, abstraction and scientific modes of organizing, collecting, and viewing like magnified views of chlorophyll under a microscope or glass lantern slides, active ways of looking for information were crossed with ways of looking and seeing for aesthetic pleasure. And then on the right here, this, this is, these are photographs. So I had these large photographs in the exhibition. 
that are, you know, like beautifully photographed and printed and framed. They have, you know, they kind of, I later will talk a little bit about how they kind of clean up the scrunkiness of my sculptures. <laughs> but you can see over here on the right where I have peeled off. So this piece here of plant detritus comes from this sculpture. So this is the first time where I'm actually kind of um, upcycling materials in a very direct way within my practice. So this becomes this over here. So, um, you know, this is where I start thinking a little bit about, okay, well, I'm using these materials. Some of them are plastic, some of them are toxic. Like how can sustainability um, and, and appropriating my own materials um, feed back into my work or become part of my process. But also I like the ideas of creating parameters. Like these are materials I have, these are materials I need to work with to create something new. And also it pushed more on the relationship between 2D and 3D. Um, this is another installation shot. So you could see here um, another sculpture that was made where a glass, a piece of glass is again supported through one of these wax columns. This was a plant that was given to me, a plant clipping from Barbara Caston, who was a mentor, um, who is a mentor of mine. She's a photographer. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just a little bit more about the relationship between photography and sculpture. Um, for me, it's super important. So the, the photographs or the images organize time differently, whereas the sculptures are always moving forward in time, you know, because they're always changing, they're in flux. The plants are at different states of life and death. The photographs take you back. A plant state is recorded, frozen, and mediated through the properties intrinsic to photography. <clears throat> Maybe the only permanent and archival thing here. In sculpture, plants are fixed or encased as physical objects, but they remain in flux. Photographs and sculptures depict the same phenomena. So they play back and forth between something fixed in time, a moment of deterioration, something fixed in time, a moment of deterioration, and then something in flux. And then these are smaller little pieces that I had in the show. They're eight by tens. And they're this series, there was five of them called A Time to Live in the Scattered Sun. These were, um, again, photo sculptures that were deconstructed, and then the shards and pieces were placed in that flexi display box that I had fabricated and rephotographed. Um, and I think like one thing I wanted to point out is because I'm trained as a photographer, I have a very methodical way of photographing. Like I talked a lot about like the four by five and moving behind in and out of the dark curtain. Um, I've always loved like that juxtaposed against this like, informal way of working where I'm not trained as, as a sculptor. Um, and, you know, there's like a certain sterility sometimes in the photographs where they're kind of cut, quote unquote cleaned up, where the text, the sculptures are much more textural and much more loose. And even sometimes, like I was saying, scrunky, there's a lot of fluid, fluidy ooziness to them. Um, so I've always been kind of interested in that in terms of process in that way of working. This is a photograph, very large, 70 by 60 inches called snake plant skins and wax and resin that was also um, in the exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art. And this was the last piece from that show. Um, this is uh, where I wanted to show this piece because I think it's a true example of the verso of the work where, you know, one side of the piece is very flat. Um, and then you um, and then you're confronted um, with this flat space and then the, and it's even becomes like a window like plane. But it's not simply a surface because it has a literal behind piece when someone walks around the glass piece they're confronted with these large hanging pieces of plants. Um, and so I that viewing experience I thought was was super cool and kind of disruptive in an interesting way. This piece was also back in the corner, so they had no idea what was going on on the other side. So that brings me to the show that you mentioned, Marley, in the intro um, called Prismatic Nature at Elmhurst Art Museum. Um, this was, I had an artist residency there. I also received a grant to produce the show. The show was a very complex show and that it, that it incorporate multi-part installation. There was um, one, two, three, like five, six or seven different components of the show. 
um, thank God I had a lot of interns at the time <laughs> because looking back on it, I don't know how I would have ever done this alone. Um, so up until this point, I have been working mostly with more object based sculptures like freestanding pieces and traditional photographs like you guys saw wall hung photographs. And at this point, it was really important for me to kind of push on the relationship between image and object. So I was not so much interested in like the traditional even semantics of a word sculpture and the word photograph. I was wanting to kind of be more reflexive and say, okay, what can be an image and what can be an object and how can they be intermeshed more? I also wanted to make something super site specific. So this institution, Elmhurst Art Museum, the first thing that's super cool about it is that one of um, Mies van der Rohe's for what well, his first track house is attached to the museum it's part of their collection it's called the McCormick house. And I knew that I was going to be able to do something in that house as well, the museum campus itself includes a um, gym museum called the Lazardro museum a gym and stone museum which is insane and amazing it also has a conservatory on it um, it also has a library on it that was designed by Mises son um, and so I really wanted to integrate uh, the whole and then also it's it's in this um, you know not to mention the historical land that it's placed upon and the history of that land the gardens that were once there um, and then the people that inhibited the landscape, which is a lot in the time of the show during the summer we're going to be kids there was going to be a kid camp there was a lot of kind of different types of activities and programming that was going on. So I also wanted to think about how my work could be more architectural um, because the pieces were starting to become so big. Um, I wanted to figure out like what it meant to make something more site specific and utilize the architecture of the space. Um, so um, prismatic nature was a multi part installation consisting of custom made window inserts there was 25 of them sculptural objects interactive hot house and living plants. Um, it was inspired by Elmhurst Art Museum's history and park setting, its light-filled glass-enclosed architecture and its relationship to modernism. Um, my project filled the Hallstetter Gallery, is what you see here, the Mies van der Rohe's McCormick House, and the corridor that links the two prominent spaces, as well as the grass area, because it had a camera obscura um, that was made that I made for it. Um, this was a book, a kind of pamphlet that I made to accompany the show to serve as a field guide. Um, so people could navigate through the different uh, spaces as they relate it to the different um, institutions on the campus. Um, so it, it was a guide to kind of understanding how the show related to these different spaces on the campus and their own history. But also it was a guide to um, like my own like narrative and personal history, so you can see here I have this little thing about it starts off with my own text saying my father wrote this home remedy and it goes goes through this and then you can actually see some of my own work, this is a piece of mine. And this is a photograph um, from uh, uh, a teacher Elliot Wigington who took his students um, to. The Appalachian Mountains uh, to the people that wrote the Foxfire book to study those people um, and make a movie about them. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that, but anyways, so this was a takeaway that people could use. Um, so here's another kind of page of the takeaway. So you can see that it goes a little bit into the history of camera obscuras because there was a camera obscura on state site and it talks a little bit about the panels that were in the exhibition. Um, this is an interior shot of the panels. These are the 25 we called them actually screens as a reference to Frank Lloyd Wright screens of stained glass. They consisted of um, these photographic, some photographs, sometimes straight photographs. Um, they also had text in them and collage, you know, collage with living plants. Um, when placed in the window bays, the transparent screens punctuated with plant segments, photographs and other ephemera became a mutable threshold marking the surface of the building while visually merging what is inside and what is outside. So there was a lot of very interesting visual overlaps. You don't see them in this one as much, but the next one over here where the space outside became 
part of the composition of the piece and there was a kind of merging of the two, the photograph and the exterior. There was also these hanging gardens that I placed upon this in the space. These were super, super big. Um, they were like eight feet by seven feet. And um, they also were meant to, like I was mentioning before, activate the viewing experience. So the viewer was meant to look you know, at the window pan, at the window screens, through the window screens. And then with these boxes, they were meant to kind of look down at them. And then I even had some where they had to look up. So it forced the viewer to be in this upside, you know, viewing position where the plants hovered over the viewer's heads. Um, you can see here the plants in a, a more live state that were hanging down from the ceiling. Um, a different kind of vantage point of the of the installation and so these panels that were inserted into the windows. Um, they it consisted of like I was saying these various collage elements, some of them were around the history of of the space like this is Mies van der Rohe's blueprints for the McCormick house and then some of them were. Um, uh, appropriations from my own my parents history so this is from one of the foxfire books called planting by the signs this is a a collage of a, a shirt my mom wore all the time when she was a kid or when i was a kid this tie-dye shirt she never took off it's a t-shirt that's scanned um and layered over it is this book that i love called the phenomenon of life you guys should look at that it's amazing and then um it's uh this is like some some text that uh, a plant scanned and a photograph this is again from that after the fires of little Sun, of the little sun collaboration I did it. And then over here is a list of texts my dad wrote in the 70s of things that he wanted to read um, and this is a cl plant chlorophyll that I made. Um, it's not real <laughs> so anyways those are what the window screens looked like and then this was the mccormick house so the mccormick house was meant to be turned into this combination of greenhouse sunroom library museum this kind of mixed space it had student work hanging in it whose work deals with modern dealt with modernism um particularly the bow house um and so i was trying to create a like a full sensorial viewing experience that includes searching and studying um, um, you can connect the dots in whatever way that you want. Um, nothing was ever linear. It was more about, like I said, learning and discovering um, and then kind of stumbling upon different surprises and delights. So I curate it. You can see I borrowed from the collection of the Lozadro Museum. I borrowed plants from the conservatory and I pulled from all of these different, you know, the library, all these different collections of the institutions around the museum. Um, and it was really about reminding us of the pleasures of being naturally and freely cu curious. Um, and I also, the last couple pieces here, this is a trading post I made based upon Mies van der Rohe's schematics for the McCormick house. Um, and people could come and take things for free and leave things. Um, so it was, you know, had a very much of a communal feel. Um, and then this is the camera obscura um, that <clears throat> was built out of all recycled upcycled materials uh, it was made out of um uh out of uh, the lens of it was a submarine window and a reused door um and um these are uh shipping whatever they're called i'm losing my train of thought now uh pallets that were deconstructed um and so this was based upon i'm trying to move a little faster now this was based upon a schematic um of my parents shelter that they made which was a lean-to that they made when they moved to Appalachia um this is the left is a photographic image of me by Eileen Meller um who had work a student who had work in the exhibition called Heidi pouring wax on Cobra Lily Mountain and the right is a drawing schematic of a shelter um of my parents um that they similar to what they they kind of made to live off the land uh, when they moved to the Appalachia. And then I'm going to move quickly just into some environmental work. So I also often use the landscape as a mold to make work. Um, so these are a series of photographic prints called Excavation on Cobra Lily Mountain, where in this photograph I'm digging these excavation sites and I'm pouring uh, wax into the sites to create these sculptural forms. Um, that also include natural elements from the area. 
um, insects and such as well. Um, and then this is a piece um, called, um, this is a piece called the plant, this is a very new piece, very recent, like one of my most recent pieces called a, a plant grows through it. So here in these pieces, I'm going into the back of my studio and finding these different plant patterns and strategically placing these molds around the plants and pouring the wax uh, while the plants continue to grow through the piece and then excavating the piece and you can see the plants um, here and the root system on the back. These are also burning pieces. Um, so most recently I started adding this element of fire to my work um, and this element still of like even pushing more onto the unknown, you know, like how how um, how can I like even have less control over what this piece turns into in terms of flux and change. Um, so yeah they became fascinating and very stressful in the beginning. <laughs> Um, because it was like trying to control how the, the piece burned and it's it's very hard when you become attached to an object that you really like and love and then you set it on fire. <laughs> um, and it turns into something com completely completely different. Um, this is another piece that I did outside for governor's island um, it's called CD glass and plant lines. Um, this is a piece called Forest Magician that I made um, shortly after I had a, a child. Um, it's also featured in the Bomb Magazine spread um, where I um, talk a little bit in, the, in that spread about Susan Griffin's writings on ecofeminism. I don't know if you guys have, have never looked at her, you should definitely look her up. Um, where ecofeminism draws parallels and points to, to distinct relationships between the devastation of the natural world and the environment um, and the oppression of women through a patriarchal society. So the this idea of gendering of nature. So when I made this piece, um, I had just had a child and so it's very fluidy um, and even more bodily, um, but then that's kind of juxtaposed against this like my putrid acidic kind of color um, the type artificial, but inside the belly of the piece are uh, mushrooms that I cultivated and then preserved inside of this um, like plastic material that stretched across the abdomen. Um, and so it was installed outside in the forest. Um, this is the piece, this is it placed inside of that bomb spread that I was showing you guys. And the text above it, I'm not going to read it, but the text above it is written from the sculptural's point of, the sculpture's point of view not just the plants um this is a piece uh an installation i did recently um at the ace hotel called prisms where i'm exploring um the plants um the plants in the natural world's relationship to interior design and transient hospitality so this is like the ace is a hotel so i was very interested in um you know, pushing on this idea of trompe-l'oeil and bringing the outside inside. So you can see here, I took the architectural details um, of the space and recreated them in Photoshop and then placed this piece <laughs> on the outside. So um, where viewers kind of walked in, these two double doors, they could also escape out these two double doors, not really in their imagination, um, if they'd like. Um, and I also hung uh, these photographs from the New Age Still Life across from, from this wallpaper piece. And the wallpaper piece is called The Grass is Always Greener on the Other Side. And it also had these sculptural elements layered on top of it as well. Um, so moving right along, this, this is an exhibition um, at Monique Malash Gallery called To Threptacon. Um, which is what uh, Aristotle uh, called said that plants have a vegetative soul called the Tuthreptakon. Um, and then Darwin hypothesized a few years later that plants are cognitive organisms, organisms with a root brain acting as a control center. Um, and so in this exhibition, I was very interested in drawing parallels between plant and human cognition. Um, but also talking a little bit about the unseen and the invisible um, systems that work in the natural world. So um, 
I'm going to keep moving a little bit faster here. And then more about Darwin, I got super into reading about these cognitive abilities that he's speaking of, um, and he talks a lot about in the power of plant movement or the power of movement in plants is the name of his book, the power of movement in plants. Um, this is basically about phototropism and the photo period, which is like the measured of dark measured of darkness needed for growth. So he basically traces plants movement at night. Um, and each one of these little dots is one of the markers of the plant's movement. So this plant has moved in this kind of movement for formation. It's been reduced to this abstraction. And this is photosensitive, this is, um, photosensitive string that I use for this embroidery. Um, so this is an embroidery on linen. And so the string, when it's exposed to light, changes colors. Um, so I did this piece, this text piece um, called um, uh, The Glass Shields, the Eyes of the Plant, Darwin's Glass House Study for um, this text, Why Look at Plants. I'm just going to skip over that. But um, I got super interested in lines and thinking about lines as like compositional elements in these works. Um, this piece was made um, as a site-specific piece for the exhibition Ghost Nature at La Box in uh, the National School of Art in Bourges, um, and it was exploring the waterways of Bourges, France, and the kind of lines and shapes, the schematics of the waterways. Um, and this piece is called Underground Colonies, exploring kind of colonies under the earth and thinking about those types of lines and pieces. This is a piece called Eclipse with Nitrogen Fixers. Um, again, this is a, a piece of glass that's wedged into a, a piece of a, a sculptural form of wax that I made um, and inside the wax is various plants at different stages of life. Sorry, I'm moving quicker here. I'm almost at the end. Um, this is um, an exhibition shot from a show last year called Vantage Points at Grimm Gallery in New York. Uh, Sonia Ameda is on the left and Letha Wilson's work is on the right. It was a group show um, that focused on variations of themes and motifs uh, core to the artist practicing drawing drawing on our relationship to nature, highlighting the ways in which we understand the relationship through mythology, romanticism, or scientific inquiry. Um, I think the one thing that pointed that stood out to me is like how all of the artists drew from archives, which is something very important, as you can see from my own practice, um, whether it's my own archive or a historical archive. Um, and they also, the, the show was great in terms of imagining our surroundings through hybrid forms and, and like kind of different, creating different vantage points in the space. And then really quickly, this piece here, you show a different iteration here. Um, on the left is called Museum Archive dedicated to Edward Steichen. Um, in 1930, Edward Steichen's Delphiniums from 1936. Edward Steichen had Museum of Modern Art had its only plant only exhibition um, in 1936 at Edward Steichen's Delphiniums. That was all that was in the show, just his plants. Um, Edward Steichen was um, not only a important curator to MoMA, he later became the photography cur curator for many, many years, but he was also a horticulturalist and was very obsessed with Delphiniums and um, I was interested in thinking about like the archive in relationship to you know his his relationship to photography, but then also like how this exhibition of plants only you know existed in the world, um, which was also through uh, completely you know completely brokered through strictly through photographic and archival printed materials. Um, so, anyways, I thought that it was um, a, a, this was a, a piece that I made to play homage to him. Um, it, it consists of um, five large parallel mounted panes of glass and suspended source images as, alongside other re real um, plant matter. Um, it's meant to resemble uh, like an exploded petri dish or stack slide transparencies. Um, so there's multiple, again, like there's glass with plants and photo gels and optical glass and film and candles and these different things um, cushioned with these panes of glass. And so 
you know, every angle of this piece is a different vantage point. It creates a new perspective on the piece. Um, so this is the side towards the side and the back view. And then the last show that I want to show you is the one that's up most recently that comes down at the end of the month. Um, these are some photographs that hang outside of the exhibition, more traditionally photo mounted images. Um, and uh you know that are created in my studio through layering of photographs and sculptures in a three-dimensional space and then photographed and collapsed into a 2d plane um but this is the show that um is up right now um it's called undulations and it's at um, the lubeznik museum and uh this show is um these are backlit film scrolls um so this is all photographic film material um, and these are all collages of my own imagery or, or even sculptures appropriated and collaged onto and printed onto these photographs. They are layered um, throughout the space in this wave formation um, that gives, they're either hanging or given rise on, by using these pedestals where these sculptures, these smaller sculptures sit on top of the pedestals these glass and wax sculptures with living plants inside of them. Um, it also has wall works like these, which are glass, acrylic, sometimes glass, sometimes acrylic pieces that are mounted to the wall. They're modular and can move to, be moved around in different formations. Um, this is a quick little video of walking through the space. So this piece has been an amazing experience for me. I have put photographs in the windows before um, and printed on film material, but this is the first time that I have um, made an installation of them. Um, and I have an exhibition coming up in, in July of this year um, at Wave Hill, which is a botanical garden in the Bronx, where I'll be doing something very somewhat similar to this, but using a different archive of images based upon the history of the museum um, and based upon, again, like imagery, imagery and, and subject matter and objects, materials within my own practice. They'll be kind of layered together. Um, so that's it. And I spoke way too long. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I went over. Um, yeah. Thank you guys so much for, for listening to me um, babble on. And this is a this is a video that I'm not showing you of me giving an elephant ear a bath and rubbing lotion on its dermis, <laughs> epidermis. <laughs> um, but, I'll, but I'll take questions if there's time or whatever you guys want to do, Marley. Thank you, Heidi. That was that was amazing. Wow. Now I want to watch this video. <laughs> oh, I'll put the link in the chat for you guys. That would be awesome. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to um, go ahead and type them out. Um, I guess while we're waiting, I'll go ahead and ask a question while everyone's typing. Um, I was wondering where you source a lot of your materials from. Is a lot of it secondhand or do you buy a lot of it or how do you go about materials? Yeah, good question. So a lot of the materials, obviously, like this stuff is like upcycled, like I was saying from like previous pieces, right? So like stuff that is kind of, you know, broken down, you know, I showed you like when this, this was kind of pulled off of the piece. Um, and so those are like what I consider to be like my main materials, like in my studio, I have bins of all of these pieces. And then I didn't show you some of the sculptures where I actually like cast objects to go on to the sculptures. Um, but in terms of like, the wax and the resin, I usually just to use two vendors. Um, and I often will also melt and break the wax back down and then recycle the wax too. So I have like these big crates in my studio of like all this like broken down stuff that I, um, I didn't have any pictures of like the way I work. I should put them down how I make the glass pieces, but you know, I, I lay out all these glass panels and I put them on sawhorses and then I take like these bins of things and I start 
kind of arranging things on them, depending upon like where, if it's site specific, that's a little different, but some of these other pieces that you guys were looking at, like the more freestanding pieces like this, or even this, I'll lay out these material, or, you know, I'll lay out these pieces of glass and I'll have these bins of materials. And then I'll just start kind of composing on the glass, you know, um, like you would like a painting or something or a collage. And then sometimes I'll actually pour on the glass and, and, you know, cast on the glass and then work around that too. So it's a little bit of both, um, like improvising. And then the plants, you know, I was like really into this thing about saving them from Home Depot. Like this really relieved my guilt <laughs> is like, that would you rather live in this art piece as this totem or would you rather live on the shelves of Home Depot or Lowe's and get some kind of mites and die. So for a while I was buying stuff from them. I also tried to support local vendors too. And then also I graft and like clip, you know, and recycle plants too and get them as gifts. Um, I get a lot of clippings as gifts too and grow them. And there's something super rewarding about that too and using it as a medium in the work. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a comment from Taylor says not a question I just wanted to say as someone who's also from West Virginia that it was super special to hear you talk about it thank you oh thanks you know West Virginia gets a lot of slack these days especially considering the politics right now so um I actually just had a student the other day that was like so I read your bio and you're from West Virginia so does that mean you're a trumper and I was like huh <laughs> Sorry if anyone here is, but I was like, no, that does not mean that. Like, there, our our family, our lifestyle was so liberal and progressive, mm -hmm. and the people we were around, you know. And it's also you get this is a communal thing too. Even if there were people that didn't align with your politics, you still can give and take. There's still things that you know when you live off the grid and live off the land. Politics sometimes don't become important. It's mm -hmm. about survival. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, a question from Kelly. Um, they said, are you familiar with Michael Pollan's books? I assume so. Yes, I love Michael Pollan. Um, I have a whole book. Of, or, um, I brought with me, in case you guys asked me, a list of um, references and books. But I wanted to tell you, I ask you about the Michael Pollan thing. Did you read the, his writing in the New Yorker that talked about the secret life of plants and the, you know, it, it created the secret life of plants created a major issue in like the cognitive kind of scientific, like or this study of plants and plant signaling because of its whole kind of foo foo ideas around plants being telepathic, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> When I was trying to actually research and speak to scientists, I wanted to have a scientist on my panel for that exhibition to Thrupticon about plant signaling. They were so reluctant to speak to me because they feel like that type of literature really set back plant science. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm interested in all those avenues. Do you know what I mean? I think that Michael Pollan, I'm not saying that Michael Pollan supports the secret life of plants. He actually like wrote this thing that was, I mean, he's written tons of interesting books. I love him. Whoever asked that question. Yes. Um, I love his Ted talks too. Uh, but yeah, anyways, I, I, I think that he's great. And he's definitely someone that I've used as inspiration. Awesome. I think we have one more comment from Gloria. Um, they said, impressive. Love your work and the conceptualizations, the environmental component and artistic expertise and amazing creativity. Oh, that's so sweet. You guys are so nice. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy that I'm here today. You're making me feel really good. I had a rough <laughs> week, so this is great. Thank you. Oh, I hope this cheered that. you up a bit. <laughs> Yeah, that that makes me feel really good. Um, thank you. I think that um, it's been fun. It's been a lot. I think with my work, there's a lot of material exploration that makes it always like new discoveries and challenges. And, and I think that um, it's deeply rooted, rooted to like my past and my my own narrative. And I'm sorry if I spoke too much about that. But I think that that is a way that we can all connect with the land, you know, with the land and the environment and 
and um, trying to be closer to it in a more intimate way, right? So, so we so we can care and find it in every day and all of our lives every day, not just you know by going to the park. Although sometimes that's how we have to do it, but <laughs> that it's interwoven in every detail. Totally. We have one one more comment from Carol. Um, he said, "Love your work. Incredible journey. Do you wear protection while working?" with wax and other toxic materials. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> uh, my husband has like begged me not to work with resin anymore. And I, I actually don't work with it um, that, hi, Andre, I can't believe you're here. Hello, uh, on, <laughs> one of my um, old coworker friends is saying hi to me in the chat. And oh. I, I chat but, um, uh yes he doesn't want me to work with it anymore but i also don't work with it that much do you know what i mean like when i don't make these pieces it's you know it's not like every day i'm in there doing this with resin so um i i try to give myself breaks uh, mm -hmm. and work with a lot of ventilation uh and you know i think that that adds like this other anxiety to my work, <laughs> you know, for myself, which I got, I guess I kind of strive on it, you know, like I think when we make work, it's not always just about the pleasure, you know, it's about mm -hmm. something else that's drawing us back. Um, and sometimes that's anxiety. And so that can be a good thing. Um, but yes. <laughs> awesome. And we have one more from Carol. Um, she said, have you written that link and in depth about your life growing up in West Virginia? If not, I hope you will. So no, uh, I feel like I talk about enough of my work, but I would like to go to that plot of land and make a piece about it before my parents get rid of it. Um, and I also do, I didn't, I haven't um, written about mine, but I don't know. I did this interview with Faith Wilding, um, for bomb magazine i don't know if you guys are familiar with her work she's she's great um she, artist it's been around for some time and um she had a very alternative lifestyle growing up um in a commune mm -hmm. and um i interviewed her because it's even more intriguing than mine and if you think mine's somewhat fascinating even though you haven't heard that much you should read her book she's writing a memoir about it oh wow yeah and it's it's uh i don't know if it's i think it is out now it's really amazing incredible um and then how she got to california and escaped it and so it's it's pretty awesome hmm. awesome thank you for sharing Mm hmm yeah all right i think i don't think we have any additional questions so we'll go ahead and conclude the program today once again thank you all for attending this week's visiting artists program lecture with heidi we hope you enjoyed today's lecture and we look forward to seeing everyone again on march 2nd for michelle seagree and i hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day thank you again heidi Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.